Hey, everybody. My name is Al Nicoletti. I'm an attorney here in Florida, and welcome to The Al Nicoletti Show, where I bring on real estate super investors, rising rock stars, movers and shakers, and leaders of clubs in the community that educate, entertain, and inspire all things Florida real estate on how you can take your company to the next level. I have a very special guest on my show tonight. I know she is so pumped to be here. She's been waiting a whole week. She's backstage. She's ready to go. I have on my show tonight Marisol Felix. She is the acquisition liaison of Cash Geeks LLC. Cash Geeks, the big, big investors, wholesalers in Northeast Florida that are killing it and crushing the market, buying up like a storm, and they are going and dominating the market. And speaking of Dom, we'll get there soon, Dom. But she is incredible. She hustles. She she works super hard. And she is the wife of Dominic Felix, the CEO, the co-founder of Cash Geeks. She loves what she does. She's the mother of three awesome kids. So it's interesting. I get guests time to time that are just investors or real estate adjacent or real estate people, but Marisol is also super mom. She is a super mom, and we're going to talk about work-life balances and how she does it, so stay tuned for that. And she's part of a huge, huge investing company that is on pace to get to a million dollars this year. Yes, they're they're going to get there. They're, they have a goal, and they're going to get to those numbers. I see her backstage, so on the show... Marisol and I are going to talk about how she is the wife of a very active investor and the fact that they work well together. I mean, it it's hard to work with your spouse. It's not easy when you go in every day and then you come home. It's it's you can commingle those lives. So she's going to talk about that and how to balance life, kids and business and the challenges that she and Dom endure with this and the challenges that Marisol faces within her role. So she has a huge role in in Cash Geeks and it's convincing sellers over and over and again and again about getting into properties or dealing with problem tenants crazy probates and helping sellers out with certain scenarios like Marisol's the type she wants to solve the problem how do you get there how do you do it what do we need to do do we have to set this for hearing if it's an eviction and the challenges of supporting four separate departments in the company so she's not just part of one department in the company she's part of four and how does she do that and we're going to kind of go through what it's like when you walk in cash geeks the culture that's in Cash Geeks and how they're how they're making it happen and growing and scaling their business. But most importantly, and you got to stay tuned for this, most importantly, how Marisol is the backbone of Cash Geeks and how she's the boss inside the office and outside the office. We'll make sure we tune in for that. We'll find out the answers to how that is. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Marisol Felix. Marisol, love having you. Love seeing you. It's so nice to have you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. First of all, that's awesome. I'm very honored. I know, you know, very honored to be on the show. Thank you. I I, I love seeing you. I love having you. I usually kind of go through this with my guests. I think the first time you and I met, we were at Yellowbird Speak. You probably remember meeting me before, but every I, I was meeting so many people, and I distinctly remember seeing you at Yellowbird Speak, and you were like, you know, hello, Al, and I'm like, hey, and it's like, that's Marisol, and I'm like, okay, I see, that's Dom's wife, so she's a hustler. So Marisol, for those that don't know who you are, tell everybody, who are you? What were you doing before you got into this real estate niche and where are you today? Okay, so I am Dominic Felix's wife. Everybody knows Dom, you know, the bald guy of Cash Geek. You know, I started back in 2017 with them. Actually, we were, back then we were RLA and it was just Dom and Gonzalo and Dom was very part-time. Gonzalo was full, real, you know, wholesale. And um, Dom, yeah, I just saw like the passion in his eyes. Like he was already doing like rentals. So he, I see the passion in his eyes to, to be in the real estate game. So at that point, I had just had my third child. And I said, you know what? I think I want to go for my real estate exam. So I was like, do it, do it. So, you know, after being a stay-at-home mom for 11 years, I decided to, you know, jump into it, get my, go for my real estate license. It wasn't easy being back focusing and, you know, being to train myself to study and actually do that again after being home for so long and only worrying about baby Einstein and Playdate. So... I actually failed the real estate exam three times. And when I finally passed, I couldn't, 
I'm the type of person I could not wait because the real estate exam was like two weeks out and here in Jacksonville. So I told him, I said, I'm going to just drive to Gainesville and I can go tomorrow morning, take the test and hopefully pass then. So I literally could not wait. So I ended up driving to Gainesville that morning, took my test, passed, and I was so excited. I was like literally screaming in the car the whole way home. I was like a little small victory for me. And then I was um, actually, you know, cash geeks like first full-time hire. At first it was really minimal part-time, but in December, we, you know, we put the baby into full-time daycare and I was like, all right, I'm going to jump all into this. I have to be home for 11 years, training myself to, you know, get up for work every day and make it happen. So eventually we passed the exam, correct? It, it, was, it was like a couple, like literally a month, but in Jacksonville, it was like two weeks away before I can get the next exam. And then I was like, no, nah, I'm going to just drive to Gainesville and do it there. So what did you learn by overcoming the different times you couldn't pass it? How did you get over that hurdle? Because I, I didn't know about that story. So like there's, there's people out there that are looking to get into real estate, whether being on the acquisition side, the investor side, but a lot of realtors, like what, what mentally did you go through to get to that point of saying, okay, enough is enough. I'm ready to take it on and pass. I literally blocked myself out from everyone. I studied in the closet for hours. I put myself in my walk-in closet with a pillow, blanket, and my book. And I just said, do not bother me. I closed all the doors. I said, and my, luckily, I, you know, my mom was here in town. And so I was like, I am going to just focus. And, and this is my thing. I'm definitely going to make this happen. And by the, th you know, the third time was the charm. Third time is a charm. There you go. What, what was that motivation though, to get into the investing? Like, did you, did you all have any other business? Like, were you a part of what Dom was doing before? I was, and when I was pregnant with my second child, Dom Jr., I decided I wanted to, you know, I thought I was going to be ready for the, be able to do it. I was like, oh, no, because I hadn't already, Emily was already like six years old and I'm trying to balance her after school life, but have a newborn. And I'm like, no, I, I'm going to. I was working with him with a cut above very part time. And I just said, you know what? I'm going to let you handle this. I'm going to stay home, be the stay at home. Mom. I support you 100%, whatever you need to do. But I, right now, the kids need me. But like I said, and then when I saw that he was, you know, the real estate fire was in his eyes, I'm like, I got to get into this. I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in here too. So husband gets motivated. He's ready to go with doing all of this stuff. You see the vision of what he sees, you both jump in together to start working on this business, which was RLA before Cash Geeks. Um, so how have you made it this great partnership working in that office with Dom? Like, like how did you figure out what did you need to do that secret sauce to making it a family run business or family business working in the office and outside? For me personally, I just had to like realize that in the office, he's not my husband. You know, we're partners, we make it work. Like I know like the, the, I joke around with him and I say, you know, at home, I'm the boss, but here you're the boss. So I kind of respect his, you know, his input. Like if he tells me, oh babe, could you get on the call and, you know, make, do this, this, and this. Okay. You know, so I respect that. So I'll go ahead and do that. But at home, you know, I'm the boss. If I have to say something, I expect you to do the thing, you know? So that's why I, I try to leave any home life at the door before we walk into Cash Geeks. And when we have any Cash Geeks problems or anything, you know, office stuff, I try to leave that at the door at our house as well. That's going to be a talk business at home, but I try to make sure to leave, leave unnecessary stuff at where it belongs, home and at the office. I can almost see you had like a, a nail on the door with a sign. It says boss Dom. And then on the other side, it says boss Marisol. And when you walk out the door, you, the thing flips and <laughs> when you come in, it flips the other way. And it's like, you know, I, do it. I should, there you go. Now you have a, a new strategy to like really keep the boundaries there. But what is it really like working in the office with Dom and Gonzalo and like that family atmosphere that's in there? Like what? is that like? Cause I know you all hang out even outside the office. It's so unusual because when you're around the same people all the time, you, you all know each other's like likes and dislikes, but you all have your own right. space and boundaries. How do you truly make that work for even you? Um, I just, you know, like it's, it's funny because like my particular department, 
like, I mean, I'm my own department basically, but I take direction from Dom and I take direction from Gonzalo. So I look at that and it's, you know, how, depending on the situation and how, where we're at in that part of the deal, I'll go to, you know, to Dom, if it's something on the acquisition side of like, Hey, you know, we haven't gotten to this property yet. I need you to, you know, figure out what's going on here. Or if it's already in the disposition side and I'm still having issues with the tenant, I'll get with Gene of, you know, so they're kind of in the atmosphere, you know, it's like, it's funny because, you know, I never thought I would have a boss that's half my age, younger, <laughs> but you know, at the same time, you know, I respect that. And, and you know, it's, he's, you know, it's like, I call him an old soul, you know, and we get along really good. And, and, you know, me and Dom, every now and then like a joke in the office, we'll out pretend like we're button heads and, and I get the sales guys riled up with like, oh, well, look, she's, it's a fellow. I'm like, no, I'm not like, it's fine. Like, like I said, I try to keep it balanced and, and make it work. I love when the Brooklyn thing comes out, that New York's, that accent comes out. So it's really coming out now as we get deeper in the show. <laughs> and, and so later we'll get like even more animated. So I love it. It's, it's Marisol. It's who she is. Uh, it's fantastic. So speaking about that working relationship with everybody in the office, what is going on in Cash Geeks is really unique. You don't see that anywhere, right? So I, I even had in my notes about Cash Geeks culture, when you walk in that office, like I even feel it now, like you walk in there, it's like, this is not just an operation. This is a motivation. This is encouragement. This is, we want you to get to the next level. There's like, let's get it. Let's get the deal. You walk in and I've seen it progress too. Cause I remember the older office. I remember what was there and, and now I see it and you got the poster boards of encouragement. You have the charts that are showing like where you are with, with money and where it's progressing. So what has been like, how is that happening? Like, what are you all doing? Are you all meeting on a monthly or weekly basis with team meetings? What is that? Well, the sales guys, I believe meet every morning and I meet with G, I think, it's on average about twice a week. We'll go over any problem properties, any any issues that I might have on my side. He, the disposition team meets almost every morning, and you know, and the transactions at least twice a week, depending on how busy they are. And they've been slammed. And actually, we've actually, I believe, we're at almost one point seven for the year. So yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. <laughs> one point seven gross. <laughs> wow. So it's been, you know, pretty active and, you know, like they try to meet as much as possible, try to get everybody like, at, what are our issues? What do we have to do? And so they, I, to me, the meetings are very, you know, very important because that way we know our problems, we know our hurdles, what we have to get through. And, you know, we have, to, you know, what properties need probate? Of course, right? We always have to know that. You have you sit in the meetings and you're thinking which properties are probate and we know where to go. So it's fascinating talking about meetings because I, I just hit me in my head. I had Whitney Ritchie on, on, on a previous podcast early on in the show. And I remember how she said in her business, in, in the culture in that office, they had like a, a, a weekly meeting called like speed bump and light bulb. So it would, be, it would be talking about like, what did you learn? Talking about what did you do? And then the speed bump is like, was there something that, prevented you from getting to that next level. So I can see how that probably happens in the office, really hashing it out, having those meetings. And what other steps are you doing with like steps in that office to make it a winning team to get to those huge, huge numbers? Like, are you all like, I see the bell in there. That's encouraging, right? Because when you get a deal, I think the bell rings, but are you all always analyzing the data that comes in on those charts? Oh yeah. I mean, I, I mean, there, we have our display boards, we have the, the leads that come in, the deals, you know, the, our um, acquisition closers are doing, and then we have our, you know, what deals are closed and we have a little thermometer showing, you know, where we're at for the year and, and actually every property with, you know, the, how much we've made on each property and the date it's closed. And I believe there's another board coming up and I believe that's going to be for dispositions, but I think they're still working on the, the connection and spreadsheets for that one. Ooh. You know, yeah, and it's so every it's it's pretty much holding each department accountable. Like the numbers are up there. You know, the pressure's on, but we have fun. You know, we have our fun Fridays. We have our once a month. You know, put put. You know, for an hour we shut down and just everybody hangs out and plays putt putt, and then we have our you know quarterly vision meetings. 
make sure what, you know, what's the next quarter going to look like and what's the goals and, you know, what's new and who's new and stuff. I could see that conversation being driven, like what's happening, what's next, what's the next goal. And you brought up a great word. It's something in the notes that I wanted to talk about. You brought up dispositions. And so I pay attention when I go to these meetings and people are talking. And I went to the vendor palooza and G Gonzalo, he was up on the panel. And, and he was, I think they were telling us like, or asking the question about, you know, how did you change your business model in 2020? And then Gonzalo spoke and G said something about how 2020 changed the way you did your model in your business, that you weren't so focused on the acquisitions. You realized you had a huge disposition benefit. And now the goal is to really partner up with people on acquisitions to get to the dispositions because you have a strong buyers or a buyer's market. So what did, what does that look like? Like, what is that side to it? Cause you're on acquisitions. So talk to us about like, what's so strong about the dispositions that you can help people with acquisitions? I mean, to be honest, we have, you know, strong buyers list. We have repeat buyers that you know, know us and trust us. And we've also worked closely with joint ventures. Like we have Hayden who is there who helps, you know, out of state, you know, wholesale companies that lock up deals in Jacksonville and we help them sell the deals to our buyers because it fits their criteria. So, I mean, there's different ways that we're getting these deals in and those are, you know, we have hedge funds. So it's just, it all kind of meshes well and, and it's been working and proving to be a, a good, a good track. Yeah, because it sounds just like you have to have a strong disposition team in order to, oh, yeah. to get there, right? So, so you have that in Cash Geeks. Like Cash Geeks, how long did it take to build that disposition side to the business? Right now, we actually have two, three, I have to count. Actually, I have to count because, you know, so we have one, two, five. So, you know, and we have, you know, new, new people actually dreaming right now. And, you know, it's, we're trying to figure out when, but probably within the past year, it's just been like there, that the whole side has been just blowing up, you know, and they know the, these buyers have known to grow and trust us and, and, you know, get the good deals for them, you know, and it's just like, okay, what's next? What's next? When's the next deal coming? I'm, I'm ready to buy. And these properties are pretty much like what I feel that these are pretty much just like selling themselves in that way, but because they've known and grow to know and trust us. It's just, just being sold, you know, it's just, they're killing it in that department. I'm just like, every day I'm getting buyer found, buyer found. I was like, okay, good. And you have to build that trust, right? Like you have to build that trust with all those buyers because is there like a certain type of buyer that Cash Geeks is looking for? Is it flippers? Is it is it just like buy and holds? Or it really depends on the type of house. Like, how do you determine that? I mean, it, it's a mix. I mean, it's between hedge funds. It's between, you know, buy and hold and flippers. You know, it's all like, it's a mixed bag. And luckily for us, it's been a great mixed bag. It's just working, you know? So, and I, like I said, you know, it's, it's just a name that people are growing to know and trust. Right. It, it's and plus every week, every week of seeing, you know, Dom and G on Facebook and, you know, people like, oh, the little guy and the bull guy. Hey, they're, they're the great team. They got good stuff coming on. The little guy <laughs> and the bald guy. When I see them, I'll make sure that's a quote. We'll make that a quote card actually for the episode. That's great. So talk to us about how you're supporting four separate departments in the company. So, right, you have the dispositions, you have the acquisitions, what are the other two and how are you managing between all four? Are you supervisor of all four? I wouldn't call myself the supervisor of all four. I, I call myself like the mom. I, I joke, I'm like the office mom. I am the oldest per female in the office. And next to Dom, I am the oldest, well, I think I am the oldest person in the office now. We have new people, so I really don't ask that. But, um, you know, and with acquisitions, I help them make sure we can get in the properties. If we have any issues with tenants, you know, it's probate, I jump on it early. Like, you start to learn what things are on the deeds to where it's like, oh, we need probate and stuff like that. So I... I double check and then with dispositions, sometimes I'm even negotiating with these tenants. Okay, well, you know, we really need the property vacant by such and such time. So I'm working on that part. 
And then transaction coordinating, sometimes, you know, I'll jump in and help them with closings because I am a notary. Mm -hmm. So I will go to seller's properties and actually do closings at, you know, seller's homes if needed. And, you know, so it's just, I am pretty much all, not all over the place in a bad way, but I have knowledge in each pretty much a little, and I did do dispositions in the beginning, beginning, but I, I mean, at that point, I didn't see myself as a salesperson, but now in my position where I'm at, I'm actually really into sales because I have to convince sellers, hey, we need to get it again. Tenants, hey, you know, we really need this vacant by this time and literally selling, you know, my point of view to them. So just as a background, before we get into overcoming the challenges and stuff with sellers, tell us a little bit. What is acquisitions for those that don't know what an acquisition part of a, of a big investor team is? Like, what does that look like? Is that the intake? That's the inbound call or the cold calling or what is that? Well, that's basically, the, well, we have the cold callers that, you know, call the sellers and be like, hey, do you want to sell your home? And blah, blah, you know, you have this, 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 do you want to you know, sell it? Most of the time they're, you know, oh, I'm not thinking about it. You know what? I'm kind of, um thinking about it this tent is driving me nuts you know so the acquisitions guys lock it up and i that's when you know so that's where that part comes in so they acquire the deal for me to get it over to the disposition so we can sell it to our end buyer very cool yes because there's people that don't just said warren just said matt coordinates the field department too yes i do make sure warren's his schedule is within reason you know, I try to make sure, okay, if he's at an appointment at 10 we, in 09, there's no way he's going to be at an appointment in, you know, in Orange Park at 1030. So I have to make sure I give him enough time for travel, you know, kind of like a dispatch pretty much to make sure that, you know, he can get to his appointments in an orderly fashion within due time. Yeah, because you're not even just trying to operate with in the office. You're trying to also coordinate about on the ground, boots on the ground outside the office. So there's a lot of different coordinating that you're you're doing, but really your big role is the acquisition side. And I love what you said. You love that sales part and, and that's your role. Like you tried the others and you realize that's your strong suit. So something that I know you wanted to talk about is the challenges that you face with sellers, tenants in different situations and going over it and over it, over it with some of the sellers that really don't understand, hey, your title's really messed up. Like you have something that you you need to do here. Or hey, you, I know you want to sell the property, but do you realize you've got a squatter in that property and you, you can't get them out? Like, right? How many times have we seen that where, you know, it's one seller, no problem whatsoever except you can't get it done because there's somebody in there, right? So how are, you, how are you overcoming those challenges and overcoming those objections and getting through to them? Well, for a prime example, the one property that we have, and I know you remember the street name, I mean, I could obviously get the street name, Steel Street. We have seller lives in Atlanta, family squatting in the house for 15 years. And we thought it needed probate, apparently it did it. But now we're working with the aunt and uncle or aunt and, and all, well, I guess the aunt's boyfriend that's living there to vacate the property. At first, they, we try to offer cash for keys, which means like if you move out, at time of move out, we'll, you know, give you actual cash in hand to move. They were not having it. Warren has knocked on the door a million times. Hey, you know, we, we offered cash for keys. They were very like, no, 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 we're not leaving. We're not leaving. Then we had to step in and do an eviction. Once the eviction was getting ready to go to hearing, then they finally lawyered up and then we came to an agreement for cash for keys. So we're right back to where we were. So that's, you know, I, I'm working that. Then we have properties with probate. Luckily, like we had the last few probates have been pretty easy, you know, so yeah. um, just those challenges, a lot of times, you know, leases are invalid and, or tenants, you know, don't want it. They don't want to pay and the seller lives, you know, across the country or not even in the country. And there's, those are the challenges we deal with. And we're like, hey, if, you know, if you can be out by this such and such time, we can give you cash in hand at, you know, as long as you can vacate the property because we're purchasing it. And a lot of times it works. It's a lot of times it works, believe it or not, you know, money talks and it's, it could be simple, you know, anything from, you know, we'll put the deposit down on the next place for you or you know, here's 300 bucks and it works. 
it's crazy, but yeah. So two things, uh, <laughs> tell everybody about this, the, uh, the strategy that you have when you find that kind of squatter situation, like how are you handling that in the cash geeks in, uh, in, in the room? And then number two, tell us a story about the craziest, craziest situation you ever had to come across where you had a seller and they just didn't get it, but you helped pull the deal over the finish line to eventually get them under contract, get it through dispositions. What did that look like? Let's see. I'm trying to think because I don't actually lock up the deals. I, like I said, I just coordinate with them to make sure we can get in and do our inspections. But a lot of times, and it's, it's funny because I know our sales guys explain the process to them. I hear them all day. I mean, I could probably, you know, reiterate verbatim on how much they tell, you know, this is the process, you know, we have to get in and to do our inspections. We may need to get in. And I, able, in my opening call with them, I tell them, you know, we have a first inspection that may be 20 to 30, 25 minutes, but we may need to get in the property X amount of times with our investor partners. And I tell them contractors and this and that. Prior to closing, because we like to get eyes on the property, because once it's closed, you know, depending on which way we go, whether it's a flipper or or buy and hold, they want to get their numbers straight before closing so they know what they're dealing with, right? I got to deal with a lot of, oh, I didn't know we have to get in again. Or how about you just buy a site unseen, just wall up the property, you can't go inside. I don't want my tenant to know I'm selling. So when that happens, we offer the whole, we're in the insurance company approach. I'll put even in, I'll even put on the calendar. I'll tell her, do not wear a cash geek shirt, <laughs> change your shirt. We're playing insurance. And then like, what well, the second and sometimes third visit even, they'll be like, how do you come? You got to come in again. And I'm talking to the tenant. I'm like, well, you know, we are an insurance company, but we price it out to different insurance agencies. So it could be, you know, Geico, I don't know, just throwing out names here. It's funny because I never thought in my life that I would be able to come up with these like lines to get in. And by that point, the seller's like, oh, wow, I didn't think of it like that. That's a good idea. So I just go with it and we managed to make it work. It, it's sometimes I'm like, am I even believing what I'm saying? Like, but <laughs> you, you get the deal done and, and every, you know, if the tenant's paying, the, most of the time they're cooperative. And like I said, sometimes we do deal with tenants that are like, no, this is my house. You're not coming in. I'm like, you haven't paid rent in like seven months. How is this your house? But, so every every house, is a, it's a different case. It, it's crazy. I remember when I had Dom and G on, they said one of the biggest deal killers or uh, issues that they had were, were tenants not letting you in in the property. So here we go again. <laughs> Right. And even to that, we've had times where we had to offer tenants money for each showing. We've offered, I, hey, you know, can we get back in the property? She's like, well, if you could bring me coffee and cigarettes, I'm like, deal. Got it. You want Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts? What's your preference? We'll bring it. That's Lawrence it. has actually bought cigarettes and coffee to a tenant just so we can get in and do our, our showing. Really? No, yeah. that easy. <laughs> Make it work. Sometimes right? it's the littlest things that make, you know, to make people happy, you know, you just got to find what it, it what works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Find it, make it happen. And so because you have that sales side to you talking to these sellers, right? How do you get into that personal level of conversation with them? Like, like, are there any strategies or tips and tricks that you have to really get to that rapport, that conversational level between you and them to get to that next step? With tenants, I put myself in their shoes. I understand I've been a renter. You know, I, I've been a whole owner. Like, I know what it's like. And especially if they have children, I can relate 100%. I have a kid in the background. Oh, you have kids? Oh, yes, I do too. I have three, blah, blah, blah. You know, we'll start talking. And then it's crazy because once evening... The, once the deal gets the transactions, they're still calling transactions looking for me. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm past this point, you know, even yeah, deals closed and they're still looking for me. I'm like, no, we're past this point now. You know, you need to speak to so-and-so or so-and-so a title even. But, um, you know, I try to put myself in their shoes and I try to bring it to a level to where, you know, I'm human, we're human. Like I understand I'm not some, you know, big wig sitting in behind a desk in, in corporate America. I'm like, Literally, I'm, I am in your shoes too. I've been there. And just really talking to them, getting personal, 
trying to get <laughs> trying to get them to understand that you're here to offer them help on getting that property okay. sold mm -hmm. and 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 doing it. So let me ask you this: like, what is the secret to this business, this operation of like? It seems like there's a system. You've automated it and you've really made it grow. Like, what is that? Is it just just constantly talking and and communicating and collaborating? Because you are, I think, Cash Geeks is really far away from the competition. I think it's very unique. You've set yourself apart and and you and it just seems like a big team everybody recognizes, right? I'm on the phone yesterday and somebody was just starting in acquisitions. They're not a real estate agent, they're not a broker. They're really getting in on the investing side. And I remember that thing that G was talking about at Vendor Palooza and I was like, "Oh, if like you ever have a problem with dispositions, I'm like, you know, you got cash geeks that you can be with and partner up with and they can really help you on that side and they were like oh yeah the geeks like cash geeks and so the brands out there the names out there what is that secret each department it's each department well we have a deal flow so the acquisitions guys lock up a deal and then it comes to me and then i start the deal flow so basically i like start our, our virtual file they even have their own agendas like what they have to do each day. Each department has an agenda and what they need to do. So the deal flow basically starts from when I get the property, I make sure I look up, you know, A, B, C, and D. Then once, you know, Warren goes out in the field, he has a checklist and that deal flow. He has to make sure he takes his pictures. There's a, you know, condition report that he has to fill out and stuff. Like, sometimes if it's a live sign, if he has, you know, make sure to check off, was it a live sign or was it, you know, just a lockbox on a property, stuff like that. Then it comes back to me, and then I put the all the information. Make sure we have a lease. Make sure there any tenant information. I check for you know certain things in regards to the house. Is it on septic? Is it on city water? You know, you know who's is it a mobile home? Mobile home VIN numbers, stuff like that. I try to catch that all before we get to closing because we don't want it to get to trip to the title company, and then we also start early title. In most cases, if we know it's a deal that's going to move quick or we know that we have our buyers that's going to buy this up really quick, they'll request title. Even like once I get you know done with my stuff, dispositions will request early title. And then before it even find the buyer, find that it might need probate or it might need, you know, quiet title or anything like that. You know, any title issues that might come up, we try to get it early, jump on it. And I've actually learned to like read through and see beforehand how it's worded on the appraiser and how I'm like, okay, well, we'll have a red flag. And if I see who signed in and why is it this person, I'm like, I'll go to the acquisition guys and I'm like, okay, uh, John Smith signed, but where's Betty Smith? And they're like, oh, Betty Smith ceased. Do we have probably, do we have anything like that? No, no. Okay. Red flag, got to get it rolling. So I try to catch that beforehand in, you know, before it gets to dispositions. And then once they get it, that's when they work their magic, they run their comps, they start marketing out to VIP buyers and stuff. So the deal flows help and the agendas help kind of systemize everything for us. And it's been working. Smart because a lot of people in real estate don't understand the concept of like title commitments and and reviewing things on on the property appraiser reviewing all the key things to look out for if you're going to run into this situation right so one where did you learn that process of check you know check the deeds or check check the property appraiser or pull title early a lot of people don't pull title early i've had i've had two probates in the last like week where somebody was like oh there's seven heirs and they only had one on contract and i'm like where's the other seven like what what's going on here and so where did you learn how to find and and do that stuff early in the deal i it's funny because i'll like i like to i don't know i want to call it be nosy but when i'm in the appraiser i'll go back to all the sales history and i'll start reading okay where's this where's that and, um and if i go into the um tax records and notice that the d the name on the tax um side might be the liens and taxes might be different than the name on the appraiser i'm like i, I kind of like trains myself but the guys also like the early title stuff the guys started doing that with dispositions and, and get that ball rolling and it's just something like i just started playing around with it just started peeking and kind of self-taught to be exact to like you know understand it 
And then I know you've come to the office and explained to us on what to look out for. And so that kind of helps too. So kudos. <laughs> well, well, good. I want to make sure it's educational and that you know what to do when you run into that situation. Like you have to, for those that don't know, you got to really pull title up front, right? And so it's really smart what Marisol's saying is that you need to be prepared. You need to do some research up front, not at the end when you, you know, you're all happy, you got it under contract. And then you go to closing and you find out it's this and this, you haven't done this. Like there's, there's wholesalers, investors out there that they may not even be from Florida and they'll think they had a deal locked up and they were missing uh, probate. They're missing four sellers. And it's like, you need to do this research and, and get in with your title company that you really like so that they can help explain this stuff or even uh, venturing and joint partnering with Cash Geeks that sees this on a daily basis is huge when you're doing your deals. So I, I, I really appreciate that you do that because even in what I see, I'm like, no, we're not doing any probates until I see that title commit. We're not doing anything. So smart, Marisol. I'm glad that you see that. I mean, like, it's funny because I need to learn to, like, create an account in the core system to look up you know, the, the, the acquisition guys. Like, oh, this seller said this property is going to be going to, you know, to foreclosure soon. Can you look up when it's going to happen? I'm like, okay, say no more. I, kind of, I joke around, kind of remind myself of Garcia from Criminal Lives. <laughs> So sit there and like they're gonna look the four screens and I'm like, well, hey, got it. Yeah, actually it's going to, you know, it's foreclosing on the hearings on this such and such date, you know? And they're like, how do you do? I'm like, I got it, I got it. Don't worry, just, just let me know, I got it. Huge to look that stuff up. Like foreclosures, when it's going to auction, when it's going to tax seed, huge. So let me ask you this, in, in what Cash Geeks has been doing and the vision of where it's going, what markets do you see are heating up in Florida? Like. What what kind of niches or markets are 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 you really tackling more so now than even last year? I mean, it's crazy, but Jack, to me, it feels like Jacksonville's still still big. You know, it's like crazy. You no, know, because Jacksonville's the you know the next big thing. I, I just read an article actually from you know I'm a licensed real estate agent too, so of course I get all the NEFAR stuff, and I see the top markets in, ja in Florida. Jacksonville's number one followed by Tampa and Orlando. So I'm like, okay, well, Orlando's given, I mean, it's tourist central and all the New Yorkers go to, to Orlando. But, but I just feel like Jacksonville's still going strong and I mean, probably will be for a while. Do you it's the next thing. It's, it's a hidden scene. And then now I actually just saw last week that Mayor Curry is actually putting advertisements in like Chicago, LA, and New York about moving to Florida. It's moving to Jacksonville because Taxes are cheap. Houses are cheap. I mean, you can get a five, four bedroom here, but three fifty, when you can get that up there for almost like one point two million, with no backyard or garage. So you can definitely get more for your money here. So, do you find there's a particular niche that is more interesting this year that you're finding come up more, or is like you're tackling more than even last year or the years before? I mean, I feel like. With us, I think a lot of our good deals have been coming actually from JVs and our and our hedge fund buyers. It's just been like blowing up. I'm like, okay, well, I like this. You know, they have a certain criteria they buy. And, you know, we have our buyers that buy for Airbnbs. So it's just, it's just a good spot to be in, you know. And the JVs also have been really blowing up with us. Like they, you know, we just to heat and off. Some so how do they get more into that JVing? So for those that don't know or may watch or listen to this later, like how do you get more? How do, can they get more involved in getting into the JV with Cash Geeks? I mean, they could reach out to Hayden and, it, you know, they pretty much if they have the deal locked up. You know, and I think the guys will also kind of guide them. Hey, you know, this is the criteria you need to be. And I don't know exact the numbers, what they work on you know, in regards to how to lock up the acquisition deals, but they have a certain percentage that you have to be in to, <clears throat> excuse me, in order to get that deal locked up. And and if it's a good property, and depending on the situation, if it's a tenant property that's producing money or if it's a potential Airbnb property, they're like, hey, you know, let's do it. We, we, we can make it happen. But Hayden was definitely the guy that reaches out for our JVs and stuff. So he is, he's our JV guy. <laughs> 
there you go. So you just reach out to Hayden Vance. He does this yeah, stuff, right? Shout out, yeah. yeah, shout out Hayden if you're watching. Yeah, I'm just see you. Yay. <laughs> there you go. The next couple of deals, you'll get the finder's fee from uh, Hayden, right, Hayden? So uh, I also support him in his JB deals too. So like I, once he locks them up with the JBers, I will help him, you know, gather them. I need this, I need this, and we got to have this all done before we get to this position. Great. I mean, that's that's an amazing opportunity for investors that don't don't know what to do or uh, don't have the amazing dispositions team or they came across an amazing lead, but they just can't get over to that next step. But they have a Marisol on the team that can do the research and check everything and, and really pull it across the finish line and even set uh, eviction things and matters for hearing. Right. So like like steel. That was crazy. So yeah, we have to know <laughs> how do you we actually get that one on the contract? So we're good to go. Oh, really? So that's going through. It's closing and everything. I'm just waiting on an update on title because it, it was pulled early. So I guess they had to repull it again because it was within a certain time frame. So yeah, we're, it's, it's rolling. You got them out. No, they actually, they're set to leave. It was a cash for keys thing that with, they're getting paid once they're out. Amazing. So we, we actually made it to court, to the hearing. The judge goes, the, they actually got an attorney the day of the hearing and we're on zoom I, that was my first eviction hearing and i'm sitting there and i'm like i don't know what to do so i have my the attorney that we're working with they came up with an attorney and the judge goes okay so you know this and this and this and their attorney was like we would like to go to mediation she's like i don't mediate these things she's like it's a or b she's like i will give you five minutes you figure it out she goes if you want to go to court we'll go to court she goes you know i'm just gonna get off camera and you guys work it out. And then their attorney told us that, that now they were willing to do the cash for keys if they can be out by such, such time. Yeah, because I remember it almost turned into a pretty interesting. Yeah, it, it almost turned into an adverse possession thing, right? Like where they were trying to say that they had been there for seven years or paid the taxes yes. or like, like, what is this? They actually, they actually pay the taxes for like, I think 10 years straight and then Stopped for 19 and 20 and 21. And that's when the seller hurried and paid his portion. So I don't know. It, it, it was very weird. Very that's interesting. You know, we got that one done. Yeah. I remember you told me, I was like, uh, I mean, there's a legitimate claim that can be made there if they did it right. Right. Adverse possession is right. a whole other world. But <laughs> when you're working with Marisol, you can, you can overcome these obstacles and overcome challenges, you know, by doing simple things like, like that, you know, setting it for hearing and getting in front of the judge. You know, I believe in that about matters, right? Get the file moving, get it going. There's gotta be a resolution and there's always going to be a solution. So Marisol, tell everybody, how do you do this? Like, how do you do work, life, balance? You know, you're, you're with Dom all the time. You're at the office. Like, what are those challenges of, of being super mom and being the, the, the super department overhead and, and doing everything? Like, how do you manage? So during school, okay, so school year, during the school year, I know like start my morning between 4.30 and 5. We have three kids, 15, 9, and four that's the thing for the last one i'm like so they all attend school luckily they all go to school within the same area so we just and down is this you know we wait he's an early riser so he motivates me to get a fairly i'm sorry my adult to go to the, the kids aren't here they're in new york with their grandparents since summer so luckily my house is quiet but the other two will go crazy and that's another thing balance dogs too so we normally get up between four and five during the school day we get the kids ready. We get to, I try to be, during the school year, I try to be at work between 7.30 and 8.30. We start at 9. And for me, it's because I do the office mom stuff. Make sure everybody has caffeine is life. If you've been to Cash Geeks, caffeine is life. There's coffee flowing by the minute. I'm going to make sure, I, you know, everything is set up. Everybody's good. Anybody needs anything. But Domino's, it's crazy. People are like, oh, you work with your husband. You must be killing each other. Like we work together, but not together. We don't go to lunch together every day. We try to keep that separate. Most of the time he goes with G so they can have their, you know, powwows and stuff like that. And I try to make sure to, you know, we have our date nights, but try to keep it, keep it, you know, balanced. And it can be a little crazy with kids because, you know, you have a child that gets sick, you have to leave to go pick them up. And a lot of times I'll bring them to the office and they have, luckily, 
the guys are flexible with me with that because of the reason reason being but it it's it's good you know like tuesday nights down works late and i am fine with that i'll go home get everybody settled in and you know just i know he works late so i'm like all right we that's our time away from each other you know you do your thing he has to go for out of town for a convention or anything like that like i kind of enjoy you know my peace and quiet (laughs) just work work life is i mean you're always in the office and you're trying to balance with the kids so um it's incredible what you're doing especially three kids you know managing it at home even in the office boss inside and outside the office right dom so (laughs) let me ask you this marisol so what's the vision of cash geeks like what's where's this headed or you know is is the operation getting bigger where's what's going to happen soon we are growing i mean we are hiring constantly there's i mean don just actually did interviews today we're looking for people always you know sales people disposition and agents you know admins whole call like it's always thing you know we want to have a strong team we like to have fun you know if you've, you've been to our office we have one minute we are playing hip hop. Next minute we're listening to eighties music. So it's a good diverse culture, and especially with the sales guys, they'll crack jokes, and you know, transactions will have their jokes, and just everybody has their jokes. But at the end of the day, we all have fun. You know, it's like we we know to have fun, but we know we also have to take it seriously. You know, at the end of the day, everybody's excited to hear that big bell ring. Right, because that means the deal came through. What's the bell? Is it that the deal closed or you got it under contract? The big bell. So everybody, like the acquisition teams all have a little desk bell and the disposition team has a desk bell. So when we lock up a new deal, they ring their bell. And when Dispo sells the deal to the end buyer and they ring their bell and transactions ring the big bell when the money has closed and funded. And then the numbers go on the board and everybody gets excited. That's got to be so exciting. See, that's the culture of cash geeks. And it's almost like I could feel that almost being a competition between acquisitions and disposition, right? You hear that bell, everybody's like, oh, we need to get the other, we need to head another bell because we got to get it under um, another deal under locked up. But the big bell, that's the, the yeah. thing. You want that thing ringing all the time because if that oh, thing's yeah. going, you're, you're raking it in. And I don't know if you've been to the office recently. Have you seen our wall or values? No, not yet. Oh yeah. So we have a core values wall and celebrations. One of them, we, like I said, we like to have fun, you know, we're not afraid to have fun, you know, but at the end of the day, we know we have to come in and bust our butts out in order for us to have fun. You know, it's just like, we have our fun Fridays every month and you just kick back and play club put into friendly competition. Everybody has their teams and whoever wins, you know, we get lunch and we get to eat at our desk. That's a big deal. You know, company provided lunch and bragging rights that we've won and it's cool i I love it again i think it's a short hole but now we have the new office it's kind of loud so i'm like i'm trying to convince the guys let's play outside let's play cornhole outside but they feel like it's too hot i'm like it's okay (laughs) we'll bring everybody out of the office and they'll come out right right so i'll say this again i think one of the most unique things about cash geeks isn't just the operation of getting the deals. I think it's the culture that you all have created, right? That family atmosphere, the, the building each other up, you know, getting, getting more things, getting more deals, trying to take it to that next level, just showing everybody you can do it. You can get to there, that next level. So I, I love what you all are doing. I think that's you very unique for a business and that's, that's not just real estate. That's a business. So keep it up, keep going. I mean, I, I mean, it's amazing what you're doing. Marisol, I always have signature questions at the end of my show. You can treat it like okay. a lightning round or you can let it rip and, and go on a monologue if you'd like. But I always ask, what, are, what is one of the most important tips to locking up a deal? <sighs> to me, to me I'm like I said, I don't lock up the deals, but to me, it's putting yourself in that person's shoes. Why are they wanting to sell their property? Do they need the money? Are they no longer attached to this property? Are they moving? I mean, we've had sellers to, you know, we have three sellers on the contract. Two want to sell with everything in the house. The other seller wants to empty out the property. So you just got to bring it, you know, to that level. You have to just nurture it. And at the end of the day, put yourself in their shoes and understand why 
they're doing what they're doing. That's that's my thing. Favorite real estate niche. <laughs> uh, it's just like I don't even know. Like it's to me, it's just do whatever it takes to make the deal work. We've, like I said, we've gone and moved people out. We've helped them, you know, actually load up the moving vans. We've done, we've had someone actually drive furniture from Jacksonville to North Car uh, South Carolina to, in order to make the deal work. It's being able to roll up your sleeves and not be afraid to get dirty. Step out of your, your, you know, your job role if you have to, you know, it's just roll out, jump in and don't look back. There you go. And your biggest deal killer that you find, I get a different answer every time, right? So Dom and G, when they were on the show, they said that the tenants were probably the biggest deal killer. They used to think probate was until, you know, I came along, right? So tenants were, but it's like title. Um, It could be appraisers. It could be the lenders holding up the deal. Obviously title holding up the deal. What do you find when you're doing all of your stuff in the office is the biggest deal killer you come across? I mean, a lot of times I hear, you know, like I said, I, some people get emotionally attached to the property. Some people feel for their tenants. They start, oh, I don't want, you know, I'm changing my mind. They really, they want to buy the property from me now. They, they're they going to offer me, you know, X amount more in the end. I'm trying to think. Just fit. Tough question. It is really tough. It's really tough. I'm trying to, figure out like, what do I hear commonly in, in my spot. And then most of the time, like, I want to say it's not the emotional attachment or even sometimes like title. Sometimes some stuff in title is like too complex. You know, we can't, we had a property recently. We can't get a payoff because the mortgage company is closed and there's no record. So that was a huge deal killer. You know, we can't find any record of, you know, the property being, he the loans be paid off, and it's just like, like a, they have in the heart, like, oh my God, it was a good one too. But and the seller was like, oh, I don't really want to go through this anymore. I'm just done. So I'll say I agree with you because it almost killed the deal that I saw today, where the lender it's been in foreclosure for a year and a half. First of all, never told anybody, or I mean, it was in the court record, but apparently nobody knew. Right, sellers didn't know until last minute. But they w were ready to close on Friday, and the bank wouldn't give us the payoff. So um, saw saw those email threads go back and forth with the title company, and you know what? They finally gave everybody the payoff deal closing on Friday. So I totally understand what you're talking about because I'm like, how can you not give somebody the payoff? It's time to close. Like, you know, and they were on the verge of probably closing and leaving money in escrow to deal with that payoff. Had it accrued interest. Wow. Yeah. Crazy stuff. Crazy, crazy. Well, anybody out there that is watching has questions for Marisol. We're still here. Marisol, if uh, give everybody your contact info, how can they get in touch with you? You know, where are you at? We'll, we'll make sure we keep putting up the Chirons, Facebook, Instagram, and who are you looking to reach out to you? I mean, anyone who needs a you know, question, like, like how do I get out? How do I get in the property? Or, you know, like, the whole cash for keys thing and you know facebook marisol felix i think instagram i think it's real marisol felix and you know everybody can find me i'm on dom's page always tagging him and still leaves um he's tagging me on work stuff so like if you could find him you find me i'll be down i'm the, um yeah so if anybody has any other questions and we got even like now i've learned so much between <laughs> evictions and and like even like probate stuff or like shh. I could work for you so now. <laughs> there you go, right? <laughs> you know so much of probates. Jeez, it's crazy. I mean, I, I've been with them since 2017. So it's like, I never thought that I would know as much as I do now. And I'm like flying through. Like, my thing is to know each property to where somebody asks a question and I could spit out, oh, it's rented out 800 a month, this and this, 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 this. I could give all the facts within a minute. I like to study my properties. So that way, if anybody comes up, even down to seller names, I try my best, but we have been so busy that I can't get to that point now, which is a good thing. You know, I can't, can't hate on that, but it, we are doing amazing. But if anybody has any questions on what they might need in order to get in the property, let's say, like insurance inspection or, you know, here's 25 bucks or here's a gift card or here's, you know, some coffee, we can make it work. Yeah. They need to get in the property. 
And especially if you're, if anybody's looking to partner up on that acquisition side, you know, get with yeah. Maris, get with Marisol. So she gets the credit from Hayden and they, and you can work with them. So because cash geeks has that strong disposition side to their business, fascinating. Cause again, I didn't yeah. realize that that's how the business kind of changed in 2020. So it just keeps sticking in my mind. I get the goal. I get the vision of what you all are doing. So yeah, Marisol, thank you so much for being on the show. You know how much I love the geeks, the cash geeks. I love Dominic Felix. We love you. <laughs> I love you all. You know, Gonzalo, you, I mean, Jackie, all of you over there at Cash Geeks. It's, it's incredible. Love the culture. And before we go, any final thoughts, any final tips for those out there? Don't be afraid to do it. I mean, I like I said, I never thought I would be in the position that I'm at now. I always thought, I was going to end up being a stay-at-home mom forever. And now I actually love it. Like, I love what I do. I told Dom all the time, I love what I do. You know, there's moments where I'm like, I just want to stay home tonight and not do anything. But just don't be afraid to step out of that box. I never thought in a million years I would be the first one to jump on a phone call and be like, hey, 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 I need to get into property. Like, Dom even said, mentioned, you know, a couple of months ago, he's like, babe, I never thought in a million years. I hated being on a phone I hate hearing my voice out talking to people because of my, you know, my asset complex. But now I'm like, hey, you know, as soon as it's, the best is when I get a seller that's from New York. Like, really? Hey, what part of New York are you from? Uh, you know, so, you know, that's the good thing. But don't be afraid to get out of your comfort zone. I actually did it. Never thought I would. But it's amazing. You get a lot done doing that. Never thought I would say that. It's good. If anybody gets on the phone with the New York crowd, just get Marisol on and they'll make that bond and you'll get that deal done. No problem. Yeah. It's crazy. Cause I've been here since 20, 2002 and, and I still have the accent. I mean, not leaving anytime soon. <laughs> and you know what? It really came out on the episode tonight, all the hand gestures, all the animation. And we love it. We love that New York style that you bring. So Marisol, loved having you. Love, love the cash game. Thank you. And uh, I'll see you soon at, at the meetings or even in the office. I'll come when you're playing the 80s music and then transition to the hip hop, right? Yes, yes. Anytime. You're always welcome. Thank you for having me. Truly honored. Love it. Love it. All right. It's a wrap, everybody. So if you want more content like this, make sure you check out the Al Nicoletti Facebook business page, the Al Nicoletti personal page, the YouTube channel under Al Nicoletti, where I have all these amazing guests like Marisol Felix. And, and what, before I keep going, just want to say I love the Cash Geeks crew. I love what they're doing with their culture. I love what they're doing in the community. They're building everybody up. They're trying to help everybody. They are an amazing company to know in the real estate sphere. They're only really getting started in Northeast Florida. I see them conquering all of Florida. That's going to be the hot market. It won't just be Jacksonville. It'll be Florida. So make sure you check them out. And all the amazing guests that have been on my episode from the beginning when the show started till now, it's all over on iTunes and Spotify. You can check all the micro content that's dropping on my Instagram. Instagram page at attorney Nicoletti. And it is just tons of content on probate partitions, quiet title, all educational, informational, and fun videos for you all to learn. So you can take your business to the next level. And I will see you next time on the Al Nicoletti show. Take care.